Hey, how you doing? Hope you all are doing great. As you've seen in the thumbnail, in this video, we're going to see what if Prodigy Naruto stuck with Anko. This is part one, and before getting into video, I request you to check the author of this fanfic and show some love and support. Name of the story is Determination by Arbalest 66 Do check it. All details and description. And if you want next part of this series, please leave a like, share, and consider subscribe. Let's get into the video. Also check out Patreon for uncensored spicy content. Link in description. A sad sigh was was heard, originating from the slumped figure of a young boy. Naruto was usually an energetic, happy-go-lucky, blonde idiot. That is at least what most of the people who knew him thought. He sadly watched over the two fresh graves he had dug and reminded himself of the bodies buried beneath. To protect someone precious, the thought lingered in his mind. As much as Zabuza denied it, Haku had been precious to him, and Haku had gladly given up his life to protect Zabuza. The words, surprisingly, made quite a lot of sense, and he had decided to accept them as his own. But there was one more thing from that battle that hit home. He wasn't strong enough. Plain and simple. If it wasn't for the fact that Haku didn't want to kill him, he would have died. Conclusion? The way he was doing things so far wasn't good enough. He needed to be better. Mopping around achieved nothing, he knew that much. He pulled a small amulet from his pocket, a gift given to him by Haku a few days ago when they had met in the forest. Would he be strong enough to do what he did? His face turned serious, and he took a long, hard look at the graves considering his options and making a decision. No more, he said in a voice that oozed determination as he drew a kanai and proceeded to cut his right palm. Ignoring the sharp pain, his blood dripping on the grave, I will no longer be weak, and I will protect those who are precious to me. I swear to you, Haku. Thank you. I will honor what you have taught me, demon of the mist. Naruto silently stood for a minute, paying his respect to the pair that taught him perhaps the most important lesson so far. He walked behind the grave and pulled out the Kobikiri Hocho out of the ground. Much to his dismay, he finds a blade quite heavy, but Naruto still manages to hold it. Deciding that it would be impractical to simply haul it around, he pulls out a storage scroll from his backpack. He always carried one around, should it be needed, although so far there was little use for it. Before sealing it in the scroll, he carefully examined the blade. The blade was actually longer than he was tall with an elongated handle. The blade had a slight curve at the top, along with a circular hole near the top, and a semicircular near the guard. But what surprised him most was the number of different seals he found on the surface of the blade. His cussed at his own lack of knowledge and swore to look up things when he got home. A small amount of blood and a few quick hand seals later, and the sword was sealed. He quickly placed the scroll into his orange jacket and went back to the others. Tomorrow morning, Team 7 left Wave. A week later, Hokage's office. After Team 7 finished their report, omitting some details, Naruto and Kakashi stayed behind to give a full report. So, now that the others are gone, what happened at the bridge? Hiruzen Saratobi asked curiously. Kakashi shrugged, and Naruto seemed nervous. It was, however, Naruto who explained, I used QB's chakra. He said shortly, startling Saratobi. Quick worries about the fox being released if the seal failed flashed through the old man's eyes, but Naruto only chuckled. Don't worry, Gigi, the seal is still there, and the fox isn't coming out. Of all the weird things in the world, he offered to help me. In fact, he gave his word to do so. At these words, both of the men looked confused. Sighing, he started to explain. Flashback, Naruto's mindscape, during the battle at the bridge. Naruto found himself in a very familiar sewer. He was in the middle of a battle for Kami's sake. He didn't have time to lounge about speaking to giant demon foxes. Still, he knew that until he finished here, he couldn't go back. What do you want, no fox? He asked in a tired voice. The great demon fox looked at him through the bars of his cage. Much to his surprise, there was not the usual malevolence or rage, just an equally tired look aimed in his direction. Relax, child. I am too tired to fight you now, he started in a serious voice. I'm in a bit of a hurry, QB. I really don't have the time to sit around. The great fox laughed for a moment at the fact that the child in front of him wasn't in the least intimidated by the greatest and most powerful demon in existence. The thought was entertaining. I know, and I like you, kid. I'm willing to offer you a part of my power, 
if you're willing. Naruto stood silent for a moment. He might not have been a genius, but he knew foxes were known to be. Cunning for the lack of a better term. What do you want in return? Clever boy. The fox near purred I ask that you let me access your senses and that you talk to me. I might even help you with your training. Deal Naruto said shortly. You trust the demon too much, boy, but you're a good judge of character. I give you my word that I will do all in my power to help you. Flashback end. After that, QB leaked a decent amount of chakra through the seal and helped me out. I managed to defeat Haku, but he gave up his life to intercept Kakashi Sensei's Chidori. Saratobi rubbed his temples at Naruto's story. It made sense, and all demons were bound by their word. So he'd let the Mater rest for the time being. Okay, dismissed. If anything else happens, inform me at once, all right? Both nodded and Kakashi went to leave, but Naruto stayed. What else can I do for you, Naruto? He asked in a somewhat tired voice. After all, he had spent most of the day fighting the greatest enemy of any Kagi, paperwork. Ah, Naruto started, mildly uncertain. I was wondering if you could help me with something, old man. Saratobi raised a curious eyebrow at his question, silently motioning the boy to continue. He was one of the few people in front of whom the boy didn't act like an idiot and he knew full well that he felt uncomfortable about asking for help. I'm looking for someone to teach me how to use a sword, he stated. That shouldn't be much of a problem. So why are you asking me? The older man asked with a small smile. Grinning, the boy pulled out his scroll and unsealed the blade. Because I doubt most people would know how to wield this one. For a moment, the third Hokage's eyes widened as he recognized the blade in front of him. He quickly calmed down, and after a short thought on the subject, sadly shook his head. I am sorry, Naruto Kuen, but there are no sword masters in Kanoha who use Zambatu, although I might have a scroll or two on a style using them. He quickly explained to a widely grinning Naruto. Also, you wouldn't have something on seals? I finished that basic book you gave me before we left. You finished the basics on seals in a week? Hiruzen asked curiously. The boy was always full of surprises. Yeah, it was easy. Besides, the sword has some strange seals on it and I can't recognize even one of them. Here, the old man mentally chuckled at his plan. He had been hoping that the boy would grow interested in seals, as they were something that ran in his family. He had prepared a special book for him on sealing for as soon as he completed the basics. Slowly getting up from his chair, he walked over to a nearby bookshelf and took out a small black book, gently flipping a few pages before handing it over to Naruto. I think you will find this book to be... Inspirational to say the least, he said with a wide smile. Naruto took the book. It was a simple black leather tome with the words Advanced Seal Theory imprinted. He flipped the first few pages and was promptly surprised. It was quite an ordinary book on sealing until you looked at the various notes scribbled along the sides. Every single page had multiple notes, chart and graphs on existing seals had explanations on their functionality as well as ideas to their use. What had him puzzled were the initials written on the first page, Amin. Whoever it was sure knew a lot about seals. He would have to read it later. Right now, he wanted to give his adoptive grandfather a thank you gift. It was the least he could do. Oh, and Gigi, I have a gift for you, he said, the fox-like grin prominent as ever I know how to solve your paperwork problem. At those words, Saratobi dropped his pipe and went wide-eyed. Two words. Shadow clones, he said, and left the office with his scrolls and book, hearing a loud thump as Haruzen Saratobi slammed his head into his desk, cursing his own stupidity. Naruto laughed and went home. It was time to train. Three weeks later, seven o'clock outskirts of Kanoha. After the last mission, Team 7 was given a week off to recover and relax. Naruto decided to use his time to train outside the village. After informing Saratobi, and placing a tracking seal on himself that only the old man could follow, he packed the necessities and went to train. But training wasn't the only reason Naruto wanted to be out of the village. Today was October 9th, and tomorrow was the QB Festival, a celebration of Minato Namike's victory and subsequent martyr to defeat said fox. That day meant something far different for Naruto. For the past five years, whenever this day came by, Naruto would leave the village to avoid the mob that would gather and try and kill him. Again, he smirked as he passed the gates. He was free for now, and even better, thanks to the book the old man gave him, he managed to place multiple protective seals that only reacted to his chakra, so no one else could enter the apartment. 
that would hopefully keep the interior safe from those that would break in. He left the gates peacefully after he showed his documents to Kotetsu and Izumo, the ever-present Chunin pair, usually stuck doing guard duty. Decent people they are, they never gave him trouble, and he appreciated it. As he walked towards his preferred training ground, a small clearing at two hours running from Kanoa, he thought of the past three weeks. They pulled another C-rank mission and a few D-ranks as well, providing him with enough money to buy a good supply of materials for seal making and sword maintenance. He hid his newfound training very carefully, although he told his sensei everything about it and asked him to keep silent. Kakashi had thankfully agreed once he heard that the Hokage was in on it and merely added one of his usual eye smiles. Sakura was clueless about his new skills, but S.A.S.K. He was certain that he managed to notice that he was acting a bit differently. Still, he needed more training. Uh, he was to master this rather interesting style he planned out with QB's help. After an hour's walk, he left from the road and walked towards the small clearing where he camped every year. He found that he very much enjoyed the tranquility of the forest. For one, there were no screaming people. He wondered what was it that he saw in Sakura. The woman was a pink banshee. He also considered that that might be the actual reason that S.A.S.K. act like the way he does to keep his fangirls shudder at bay. He'd have to talk with him about it. Not that he'd likely say anything, but still. The familiar clearing came into sight, and Naruto cleared his mind of all thought. It was time to begin his training once more. He put down his backpack and started unpacking. Carefully, the few pieces of equipment he would need, he prepared to start his week-long training regiment. A week supply of food pills, along with a small box containing 10 chakra soldier pills. These, while expensive, were a fail-safe for the unpleasant possibility of attack or healing. He made mistakes with his jutsu at times, so he learned to be careful. Okay, Thomas Sturdy got up, let's see if I got it done by now. Shadow clone jutsu. He cried, for the first time managing his sealless jutsu. Each and every one of his hundred clones grinned. Listen up, I want 50 of you doing tree climbing while spinning leaves on all of their fingers. 30 doing water walking while practicing the same. As for the rest, grab one of the books or scrolls and start reading. While the clones distanced themselves from the clearing to practice, Naruto sat down in his meditative position. It was time to once more start sharpening his senses. Tying his etate over his eyes, he started focusing. First on the strongest sensation, the sound of the nearby river as it coursed its way through the rocks and ground. He counted all the rocks he could hear, slowly but surely separating each sound from the other. Next came the sound of the leaves. He tried to separate the number of different species of trees nearby. QB's training was strange to say the least, but he had already seen the effects. Zabuza's silent killing technique was brutally efficient, but the style he was building would be even better. Focusing a small amount of his chakra to his ears, he felt his sense of hearing expand even further. Sharpened by training and enhanced by chakra, he carefully let his mind process more information. The first time he tried this, he nearly lost consciousness from the input. It was a strange feeling, to say the least. He could actually separate sounds of individual leaves rustling in the wind. He could actually hear the wind howling around the trees. The sound was weak, but it was there. Leaving his sense of hearing in the background, he focused on each and every one of his senses except for sight. Unlike the other senses, sight took up much more of his concentration, and he wouldn't be ready for it in a long time. After this exercise was completed, he got up and summoned another clone, ordering him to grab a bunch of leaves while he unsealed his sword from a seal on his arm. Its careful placement made sure he could retrieve the sword directly into his waiting hand with very little movement and a small amount of chakra and blood. Now came the hard part. Only two of his normal senses were needed, sight and scent. He let all other sensation leave his mind as he slowly began reaching the outside world with his chakra. Within a limited, for now, range of five feet, he formed an invisible sphere that supplemented his normal chakra sensing abilities. That combined with battle instincts improved by training with clones that were out for your blood made sure that within those five feet around him, he knew everything exactly for what it was. No jinjutsu or deception worked. He even managed to see through chakra-filled constructs such as the hidden mist jutsu. Radiance was a style of combat he found to enjoy very much. It wasn't just kinjutsu. 
It was also brutally efficient as a supplement for taijutsu and infiltration. Over his several weeks of training, he had trained his sixth sense to the point that he had to consciously suppress it to stop using it, which he found out he'd have to sense the sense when properly applied could easily see through clothes. Start with one leaf, he whispered to the clone who stood outside his range, while keeping on hand on the sword now sheathed diagonally across his back. After a lot of training and a bit of chakra, he was finally able to draw the sword single-handedly, but it was still quite impossible to wield it so in combat. Focused perfectly, he heard the leaf begin to fall and discerned its location before it entered his range. As soon as the leaf touched the sphere, he drew the sword while adding a second hand to the hilt and cutting the leaf in half. Two leaves, he said in an emotionless voice that betrayed his concentration. Several kilometers east sundown. This was not a good day, though one Anko Mitarashi as she limped through the forest. Incorrect information is deadly in her line of work, and her entire mission was almost a failure because of it. She gripped her jown in vest as she tried to retain a grip on her rapidly failing mind. Anko paid little attention to her near-shredded clothes or wounds, she was still a long way from Kanoha, and unless she reached there, she was dead. She was sent alone on an assassination mission, but that had been a trap, and she could bet her ass that someone from the damnable civilian council once more tried to get rid of her. Silently cursing her fate, she continued limping. Is this how it's gonna end? Fuck, I don't wanna die yet, she cursed, doing anything she could to keep herself awake, but it wasn't helping. The last thing she saw as she fell was a barely visible figure rushing towards her as her world went black. Damn. For a while, all she knew was darkness. Is this death? She idly wondered as some semblance of consciousness returned to her. She didn't feel any pain or tiredness, only a soft warmth. But the feeling was soon lost to a wave of pain. She was certainly alive. She groaned as she opened her eyes. She tried getting up, but failed miserably as she was too weak. Nearby, she spotted a boy, about five years younger than her. She noted the spiky blonde hair, kept up by his hate with a leaf symbol and pronounced whisker marks on his cheeks. Where did I see those before? His clothes were simple, black cargo pants with a lot of pockets over equally black steel-toed boot and a red shirt. She quickly realized that she was covered with a long, white, black trench coat which most likely belonged to him. The boy was fast asleep. What drew her attention, however, were a number of tattoos on his arms, most likely covered by the trench coat's sleeves normally. After looking at him, she took a look at her surroundings. She was in a tent, her belongings carefully sorted and placed within reach, at least what could be salvaged. You're awake, she heard the boy say, without opening his eyes. She opened her mouth to say something, but was instantly interrupted, don't try to speak yet and don't move. Your body is too tired to work normally. Go back to sleep. You're safe here. We'll talk tomorrow. While mildly annoyed by the boy's comment, she knew he was right and went back to sleep. What do you make of that seal on her shoulder cue? Naruto asked curiously as he looked at his copy of said seal, referencing the array to everything he could think of. Curse seal. Life category Q, B answered quickly. Damn, I'm not good with those yet, but I've identified a few of the components. A part of it is similar to mine. One is a chakra conversion seal, but it has some rather unique components. Another seems similar to those torture seals I read about in the book. Do you think I should ask her about it? I doubt it's a pleasant subject for her though. Try, but don't pressure her too much. Naruto stopped this conversation when he felt the woman before him moved. Although he didn't know her by name, she was a Kinoha Jounin. That much was certain from her uniform and symbol. From her equipment, he could assume that she was an AMBU and that she was very likely on an assassination mission. Having several vials of various poisons, along with precision weapons such as Sunban, left little room for speculation. Unlike many of his generation, after the events on that bridge, Naruto wasn't in the least naive when it came to concepts such as good and evil. He knew all too well that in the shinobi world, everything was just a shade of gray. Therefore, it would be foolish to judge another because of it. He was grateful that QB had pressured him into analyzing things whenever he had the chance. He now understood that it could grant him an edge over his enemies even outside of combat. He picked up a bowl of stew he was preparing and walked over to her, as she was just waking up. Food? He asked politely, offering her the metal bowl and spoon. Thanks, she took the food and ate gladly while Naruto joined her. They ate in silence, 
both parties pinning their time, studying the other. Naruto, of course, had to control himself and not devour food. Instead, he ate rather normally, his normal manners, or lack thereof, currently absent. For some reason, Naruto felt a need to behave. So, Naruto tried to start as they both finished their meal. She seemed nervous. I, uh, thanks for saving my hide, she said with her head down. Anko Mitarashi hated to be weak and to need rescue, but she was saved regardless. The least she could do was to try and be nice. No need to thank me, he said with a small smile after all. We're both Leaf Ninja, right? He added, sheepishly grinning while he put both his hands behind his head. At that time, he didn't know why, but she looked at him strangely. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, he said as he offered her a hand. Anko Mitarashi, she answered, accepting his handshake. This small gesture seemed to break the tension between them. It seemed that at this moment, rank and position didn't mean anything as the pair sat with food and tea and chatted for several hours. A casual observer would notice a large number of clones training in the background Naruto found that he enjoyed talking to Anko. She was somewhat rough around the edges and could be downright scary if she wanted to, but he was sure that she was a good person. Now, there was just one thing more he wanted to ask her about. He knew it wasn't right, but his damnable curiosity for seals was getting to him. Naanko san I was wondering about something he said, his face turning serious. What the hell, he'd ask, and if it was as bad as he thought, he'd tell her about his own seal. Oh, she said in a teasing tone, but noticing his face, realize something, so you've seen it. Hi, I don't want to pressure you. But I was wondering if you could answer a few questions about that cursed seal. She looked at him, a hard expression on her face as she studied his intentions. She wasn't certain what to expect, but what she found surprised her. It was innocent curiosity, the kind little children have when they start asking parents questions about something new they saw and didn't understand. She sighed and shook her head, wondering why she was even considering doing this. Shoot, she said shortly. But much to her surprise... Naruto took out a scroll and a pen, preparing to write down what she said. First, who made the seal? He asked, immediately cursing himself when he saw her wince. Orochimaru, she answered venomously. What does it do exactly? I felt corrupted chakra and several other arrays, but I can't identify most of them. It allows a person to forcibly draw chakra and then corrupts it, making it stronger but damaging the body and mind in the process. It also allows Orochimaru to burn that chakra and directly damage the bearer. She explained, and Naruto scribbled furiously. He decided that he certainly didn't like Orochimaru. Well, I can tell you two things. Orochimaru is a genius, and I hate his guts. He deadpanned, while Anko watched him, somewhat amused but mostly curious about him. She really didn't want to talk about it, but the way he followed her voice and wrote, she knew he was really interested in it. She didn't know why, but she couldn't see him place such a mark on someone. So, what did you figure out about the seal gaki? She asked him, her curiosity still evident. Okay, here goes, you're in for a small lecture. The seal is in reality a massive array consisting of several smaller arrays which each accomplish a function. First, there is a chakra converter coupled with an amplifier and a soul container. If I had to guess, it contains a small piece of snake shit soul which is used to corrupt the chakra and keep the bearer in check. Second, there is that thing with the punishment. It's a somewhat complex torture seal. I haven't yet mastered those. We use those in interrogations, Anko added, trying to get into the lecture. She felt like the roles were reversed, that she was the little kid and not him, even though he was only about five years younger. Most likely one like that. The third array affects your mind. It's probably the part that corrupts the mind. Now, there was a fourth array but it is completely dormant. I have no idea as to what exactly it does, but I can tell it's powerful. There are a few transformation seals in the array, but I can't figure it out. She stared at the boy in front of her, wondering how the hell he knew that much. Not even the Hokage figured out that much. And he simply listened to what I told him and with a short look figured most of it out. Why are you looking at me like I grew a second head? Even a half-decent seal user should be able to identify all of these seals. You made the job easier by telling me what they do. Removing it, however, is a different modder entirely. Naruto snorts at the comment to remove. True, but it can be altered. Any seal can be altered. He tried to explain. Anko looked at him somewhat suspiciously. Look, the chakra amplifier is stuck there, 
But the part that contains his soul is removable, as is the torture seal, along with that fourth seal, as long as you don't activate it. As for the mating mark, that's a bit harder. For a moment, Naruto noticed that the woman before him had dropped her guard. For a moment, he looked in her brown eyes, and what he saw shocked him. Betrayal, pain, loneliness, sadness. It was like looking at a mirror. But the moment passed, and those eyes were gone. He smiled sadly. Want to know a secret? He asked, still smiling sadly. Enko, who had been silent for a while now, nodded. Naruto gave a real smile this time as he raised his red shirt watch. He started focusing his chakra slightly on his torso, and to Enko's surprise, a large seal appeared over his belly. Enko watched in fascination, quickly remembering what it all meant. You're the container for QB, she said quietly. Naruto nodded. Idiot, she said softly, you saved my life. How the fuck can I hate you? For a second time, stood still. Then he laughed, and she joined in. It was funny, but neither of them laughed because of it. There was something liberating about the fact that you weren't alone in the world. After Haku had died, Naruto didn't expect to meet someone like that again. It was not that he wished such a fate upon anyone, but it felt nice to share it with someone. After a few minutes of laughing, they both sat in a relaxed silence, each eyeing and studying the other. There was no more tension between them. It was nearly noon by the time they finished their conversation. Hey, I need to do some physical training. I'll take you back to the village later today. Okay. Naruto kindly asked. He wasn't assuming anything, but apparently, Enko had other ideas. I'm not a damsel in distress, Naruto. I can take care of myself, she answered him while pouting. While she was a bit angry, Naruto couldn't help but laugh, which annoyed her even more. She didn't like being handled with care. His smile faded. It was somewhat worrying how similar they were. He tried his hardest to look stern and serious. Not until you are in a condition to safely get home. I'll send a message to the old man that you are safely recovering here with me and get you home by tonight. Fair? Of course, the stern look didn't really work, but the message was clear, and while still pouting, she agreed. While Naruto returned to physical exercises, he left a clone to see to her needs. Enko decided to spend the time relaxing. A soldier pill and a blood pill, along with food and rest, were all she really needed to recover. She was glad, nonetheless, that her wounds were cleaned and bandaged. Not a bad job, she thought. She had taken a look at the clones that were training nearby. Chakra control, jutsu, reading all that while Naruto was training his body. Why does he push himself so hard? She muttered under her breath. The clone reading next to her didn't hear her, thankfully. She was painfully aware that her own training regiment had nothing on this boy's. After a few seconds, the clone next to her closed his book and turned to her. You'll have to ask the boss that yourself. He said softly before poofing out of existence. Well, I did answer his question, she thought gingerly as she began cleaning her fingernails. With a canai, she spent the rest of the day watching the boy train, eating and resting. She didn't know why, but just watching him was relaxing. He had a drive she saw in very few people. She was a good judge of character. She had to be ever since her sensei betrayed her just to survive. It was weird. The boy was much like her, but he didn't give in to hate and anger. Her? She became a sadistic bitch to keep people away. She had only a few friends, and she doubted he was in a much better situation. But there was one thing she was sure of. The boy in front of her was much stronger than her. Sighing in resignation, she made her decision. She drew out a small scroll to write down her report. Quickly finishing her action, she bit her thumb to draw blood for her next move, a summoning jutsu. A few quick hand seals later, a three feet long snake appeared from the cloud of smoke. Its grayish brown scales blended well with the earth and its slitted golden eyes stared into Anko's own. Yes, mistress? The small snake asked, its forked tongue flicking. Anko rolled up the scroll and offered it to the snake, who coiled around it. Sheriz, I need you to deliver this scroll to the Hokage. Hand it to no one but him. Understood? If he has a reply, bring it over. Yes, and the snake vanished as it unsummoned itself. Well, that takes care of that. She could now calmly spend the rest of her day recovering and studying this blonde enigma that was before her. Naruto was currently busy trying to develop a new move with his oversized sword. He was painfully aware that simple swinging couldn't get the job done, but the collection of seals on the sword were amazing. 
It was truly a fascinating weapon, and if what he analyzed was correct, Zabuza had only scratched the surface of the weapon's power. The chakra reinforcement and sharpening seals kept the weapon in perfect shape without any need for maintenance, while allowing it to near effortlessly slice through armor and flesh. Most of the seals dealt with the use of chakra on one level or the other, but the most interesting ones were one that allowed a chakra shell to be formed around the weapon, and another, but this one was strange to say the least. Naruto knew how to identify most basic seals, and even quite a few complex ones, but he was nowhere near seal master material. Identification was all nice, but if you couldn't break apart a seal or build it from scratch, it was near useless. The last array was a simple chakra channeling seal coupled with something he most certainly didn't know how to identify. He needed an expert on this. The movie was planning to pull a focus on gathering a high amount of chakra to form a solid shell around the sword and unleash it on impact, causing a localized explosion. He had thankfully figured out how to control the seal to release the chakra, so all that was left was to figure out how to do it without killing himself in the process. Anko curiously watched as Naruto took of his shirt and proceeded to draw his sword from its seal, much to her amazement. Everyone above Jinin level read bingo books, and it was easy to recognize one of the swords of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. And what's worse, before her was a kid of 13 carrying it. Hey Gaki, where did you get that sword? She asked curiously. From its previous owner Naruto deadpanned, which in turn caused Anko to sweat drop. Actually Anko, could you help me out a little bit? She raised an eyebrow, waiting for him to continue. I need you to throw kanai and shuriken at me. He explained in a serious voice as he dragged his headband over his eyes. For a moment, Anko questioned his sanity, but she didn't have any fun for quite a while. Sure, she said in a sickeningly sweet voice, any rules? Naruto swallowed hard, wondering whether this was such a good idea after all. One at a time with three second intervals. From when I say now till I say stop, he quickly explained, turning towards her chakra signature with a ready blade. Use my supplies if you're low on them. Anko chuckled. Naruto, on the other hand, was now positively worried and hoped that she wouldn't kill him. Still, he expected her to at least try, or this entire training had no purpose. Now! He yelled, and for a second nothing happened. But then, he quickly felt a kanai enter the field of radiance around him. Aimed at his head, a rapid move from his sword deflected it. Two seconds later, a shuriken followed behind it, this one aimed at his throat. This kept going for a few more minutes until Anko had exhausted his supplies. Anko was curious as to how the boy managed to block every projectile she threw at him, since he was blindfolded. He didn't look like a Hyuga, so Byakugan was out of the question. So far she had squat on his skill. They gathered the shuriken and kanai. Two at the same time now, with a second break? Okay. He asked her. Anko winced at his determined voice. He could easily get killed like this and he was tired from the last run. Even thought his eyes were still covered. He seemed to see perfectly. Don't worry. I'm playing it seriously this time. And I'll be moving this time. Can you do it? Sure. But it's your funeral gaki, she answered in a mildly worried tone. The kid was fun. It would be a shame if he died, but still he did ask for it. Oh well. Naruto took a long breath to calm himself. Now was the time to test his growth so far. Now. Instantly, two kanai flew at him. With minimal movement, he positioned the sword to block the two projectiles, which were quickly followed by two speeding kanai. Anko wasn't playing around. He smirked and moved slightly to his left, raising his sword to block the shuriken. He barely had enough time to do so when another pair of kanai followed them, one aiming for his head and another at his leg. He silently cursed, knowing that he wouldn't be able to block both, so he sidestepped the any aimed at his leg and blocked the one going for his head. Damn Gaki, you're good, he almost reverently whispered. Thanks for helping me, Anko-san. If there's anything you need, he trailed off there. Tell me how you did that thing with the blocking. Naruto smirked. If you promise not to tell anyone except for the old man. He replied quickly. Anko grinned and nodded. All right, now listen carefully, he quietly said. And Anko nodded conspiratorially. I use my chakra to project a thin field around me. It works as a sixth sense when combined with my well-trained chakra tracing skills and enhanced hearing. Anko's eyes widened from hearing it. It was remarkably simple, but freaking brilliant. Now don't go around spreading that. It's only a part of the skill itself, 
and I need an edge over my enemies, that thing won't go down in my record. And it's incomplete anyway, he added the last part sadly. Incomplete? She asked him once more surprised. Yeah, I can't use my eyes. He explained sadly my mind is trained enough yet. That makes sense, she thought. Use six chakra enhanced senses and you have almost no blind spots. Her train of thought on Naruto's techniques was rudely interrupted. We should get going, he said quietly, drawing her attention. Yes, she answered, a slightly forlorn look in her eyes. Naruto quickly packed up his belongings and began escorting Anko back to Kanoha. He hadn't planned to return yet, but still, he needed to ask Kakashi and Sarutobi something anyway. Along their journey back, Naruto had taken every precaution to hide his training equipment and skills. Anko curiously watched as the boy tied bandages over his arms to cover the seals. His attire was normally tied around his forehead, keeping his blonde bangs from falling on his face, and there was nothing to point that the boy was carrying many scrolls or an oversized sword. For a moment, she had wondered why take so many precautions to hide his training. Once more, she was getting a taste of what made Naruto Kanoha's most unpredictable ninja, as the boy, more or less, read her mind. A ninja's most powerful weapon is deception, he said softly as the gates of Kanoha came into view. Enko instantly recognized the meaning behind his words. If his enemies don't know what he's capable of, they will at best underestimate him. She was beginning to appreciate the kid. Quite contrary to what she had heard, he was quite clever. They both entered the city with a short show of documentation, the guards unwilling to make a fuss. This is where we part ways, Anko-san, although I certainly wouldn't mind seeing you again, he said kindly, earning a quick nod from Anko. Sure, Gaki. Look me up. I'll usually be at the Dango place or at Training Ground 44. See as she waved at him while she bounced off across the rooftops. Naruto smiled and waved back as he did the same, heading towards his own apartment. It was time to check whether his new security seals had been doing their job properly. He cringed as he saw the QB festival in full swing. This was not a good time of the year for him. He quickly scanned the area for unfamiliar chakra signatures while suppressing his own chakra. It would do him little good to attract attention. Bounding off towards his own apartment building, he silently praised the man who created the building for making a roof access. He quickly moved to the doors of his home. His formerly small smile, now developed into a full grin S, he noticed that all of the seals were still in place. Channeling just a small amount of chakra into the seal locks, he slipped inside. He was shocked when he recognized another chakra signature inside. 2030, Dango Place, Kanoha. Of all the places popular amongst the shinobi populace of Kanoha, there were two that help a place in their hearts. First was the nameless shinobi bar, carefully concealed within the city's depths, where one could only find seasoned veterans from the Third Great Shinobi War, along with veteran Jounin and AMBU operatives. The second, however, was far more interesting to the more common populace and was simply known as the Dango Place. There were no fancy signs, as the whole institution was somewhat off the beaten track, commonly visited only by folks he explicitly went there. The point of interest there was the unofficial so-called Ninja Lounge. In reality, a collection of booze to the back of the bar slash fast food stand, where one could usually find Chunin and Jounin ninjas sitting and drinking together almost every night, and unlike the dark atmosphere of the previous place, here spirits were usually much higher. Unfortunately, the only person currently sitting here was one Yuhi Kurinai, the somewhat infamous Jinjutsu mistress, or better known, Ice Queen of Kanoa. Now one might go and wonder why this young woman was sitting here annoyed and drinking. But such a thing would be obvious to any who knew whom she currently cursed while drowning her sorrows in sake. Thankfully, her problems were quickly forgotten as she was joined by her old friend. Two portions of fruit dango. Anko ordered her food before turning to Karina with her usual smirk. She had just finished her report to the Hokage, who surprisingly, or not when she thought more about it, had asked her about Naruto's progress after she had finished her report. So, what are you up to Naichan? Still sulking over that bonehead, Asuma? She teased playfully. Her words never held any malice when directed at her friends, although any outsider would be hard-pressed to realize that. Karinai sadly nodded. Her relationship with Asuma Saratobi was complicated at best. The man could be the sweetest guy in the world at times, and a complete idiot at others. In a word, he lacked subtlety. Anko smiled as she put her arm around Karinai's shoulder trying to convince her that everything will be okay, 
and was glad to see that it worked. You didn't tell me Anko Chan. How did your mission go? Karina I asked with genuine curiosity, only to be mildly surprised at the number of emotions that flashed through Anko's usually guarded face. Shit hit the fan, but the way back was fun, she shortly explained. Karina I raised an eyebrow at her friend's comment, curious as to what she meant. Anko began explaining the events of the past few days. Naruto's apartment, same time. Hello. Naruto Naruto watched in amazement at the collection of people gathered in his apartment. He recognized everyone, either by scent or by face. The Hokage, Kakashi-sensei, Iruka-sensei, and even the pair of Anbu who, he remembered, save his life from the mobs, quite a few times Yugao and Tenzo, better known by their code names as Cat and Tiger. Naruto stood silently as everyone shouted happy birthday, and he could feel tears coming down his face. He couldn't, he wouldn't stop them. He ran forward and hugged the old man, who returned the hug and knowingly patted his back. Everyone present smiled at the interaction between the two. It was his 14th birthday, and for once, it would be a good one. As he released the hug, Naruto remembered something useful. One of the first things he did was to place several hidden storage seals around the house. One such was to store a few objects he got from his missions. One was saved for such an occasion. A small amount of chakra unsealed four bottles of high-quality sake along with six saucers. I've been keeping this for a special occasion, he said with a wide smile, Kimo's finest sake he added, causing a wide cheer aren't you a bit too young to drink Naruto? Irika asked, somewhat worried for his little brother, as it were. Naruto scowled for a moment, then simply shrugged meh. Old enough to kill. Old enough to drink, he quickly explained, causing a chuckle from everyone present as he passed the saucers and poured the finely chilled sake. The whole group gladly accepted, and as always in such occasions, people began to talk. This chatting lasted for the better part of an hour, as stories from old missions were retold, new ideas shared, and a liberal amount's sake was drunk. Most were somewhat surprised to notice that Naruto, who should by all accounts be a lightweight, didn't even get tipsy, but quickly wrote it of to damnable demon foxes, to which Naruto, and by proxy, QB, chuckled. While Naruto would have liked for all of them to stay a while longer, each and every one of them had duties to attend to. So after an hour, it was time to part ways. But not until Naruto received his presence. Irika, kind and practical as ever, had bought him a new calligraphy set for his seal works with high-quality chakra ink. Kakashi's gift was a scroll containing a single jutsu of every element, along with a chakra paper to figure out his affinities. Yugao had bought him a set of chakra weights, for which he was very thankful, since he needed new weights badly. Tenzo, aware of his forays into herbalism and medicine, had gathered seeds of several rare medical plants along with a scroll on medical ninjutsu. And finally, Saratobi had bought him a new coat. Naruto quickly unwrapped the clothing and put it on instead of his usual coat. The long red coat easily reached his ankles, decorated only by black flames along the bottom rim, with somewhat oversized, flowing sleeves which didn't inhibit his movements in the least. What he also noticed, and that made him chuckle, were several reinforcement and mending seals along the inner back, making sure that it would easily be maintained along with storage seals on the insides of the sleeves. He liked it. He liked it very much. And to be honest, it looked good on him. After he had said goodbye to the people he knew he could call friends, he took up his coat and carefully laid it on his bed. He quickly summoned two clones while he took the chakra paper, ordering the two to start reading the scrolls while he found out just what he was capable of. Carefully reading the instructions that went along with the paper, he channeled a good amount of chakra, and watched as the paper split itself into four pieces. Each and every one of them was blank except at the corners. One was slightly soaked, the second mildly crumpled, the third had a crumbled corner while the last had its corner burnt. Naruto watched curiously at the paper in his hand. Now what the heck does this mean? He asked himself, causing a shrug from his clones. Damn, they'll have to ask the old man about this, he quietly muttered as he disposed of the papers. He picked up the small box of seeds that Tenzo had given him and quickly opened it. Inside were four different species of medical herbs. Dragon's tongue, a rare plant endemic to Kanoa's forests. Its leaves are usually used as a potent antitoxin when chewed or made into a tea. Roseberry shrub, a strong source of vitamins and minerals, somewhat common but very usable. 
the coca plant, which usually grows into a tree, a powerful mental and physical stimulant, but rather hard to raise in this climate. And finally, a single seed of the fire flower, a rare herb which releases a highly flammable sap, while its flower scent is used to combat mosquitoes and other such pests. A small scroll was packed along, explaining what condition each of the plants needed. Naruto's mind went into overdrive as he considered the near impossible growing conditions for each of the plants and how to provide them. Of course, the answer once more came from the arts of sealing. A simple barrier seal could be used to maintain certain conditions within a limited area, such as one or more pots. His musings on botany and seal work were rudely interrupted by a sudden influx of information, a signal that his clones had finished reading the two scrolls given to them. The medical scroll mostly contained exercises meant to draw out and form the green medical chakra used to heal wounds, and a few select jutsu that in conjunction with his massive chakra reserves would serve him well. The other scroll, however, had five jutsu on it. Wind release. Great breakthrough in offensive jutsu, where the user blasts forth a strong wind blowing back all in its path. Water release. Water encampment wall. A defensive jutsu that creates a wall of water meant to block mostly fire jutsu and projectile attacks. Lightning release. Shocking paralysis. A support jutsu that temporarily paralyzes a touched opponent and fire release. Phoenix fire and offensive jutsu used to fire multiple fire projectiles that are mostly used as a distraction. And finally, earth release. Underground projection fish jutsu. An offensive slash defensive jutsu that allows the user to sink into the earth and move underground. Naruto grinned widely at the possibilities and decided to do his best to learn and master all five jutsu. Affinities be damned rubbing his hands while thinking over the possibilities, he approached his last gift, a lacquered cherry wood box that contained his new calligraphy set. With due reverence, he carefully opened the small box to find several bottles of high-quality chakra ink along with multiple brushes of equal quality. He quickly realized that all of these gifts must have cost quite a bit, and biting his lip he promised that he'd make something for them in return. Drawing out a scroll from the desk on which he normally worked with his seals and herbs, he sat down on his couch and began writing notes on what he would create. 2100 hours, Dango Place, Kanoha. And that's about it. The Gaki escorted me back to town, and we parted ways Anko, finished her retelling of the events of the past few days, carefully omitting any details on what exactly was Naruto training. She wanted to tell her friend, but Naruto had taken so many precautions to keep it a secret, and he saved her life. It was the least she could do for him. He sounds like curious kid, that Naruto Karinai idly commented as she sipped a bit more sake. Enko simple nodded. That he is. A voice behind them suddenly announced. Both ladies turned to notice the cyclopean features of one Hataki Kakashi. Oi. Cyclops Enko greeted in her normal teasing tone. What brings you here? Drinks and dango. He deadpanned and people gossiping on my students, he added with an eye smile, causing both to chuckle as he sat down and ordered his food. How's your team, Karinai-san? Kakashi asked curiously while he devoured his dango, without dropping his mask, of course. Not too bad, I suppose, Karinai, quietly said Kiba, is way too arrogant, and Hinata has confidence issues. Shino is the one that needs the least work. She quickly explained, like all Jounin senseis, saying the least possible about their students' skills. What about you, Kakashi? Kakashi somewhat nervously scratched the back of his head. Well, I've nearly broken Sakura out of her fangirl personality. S.A.S.K. is being his usually brooding self. But that's changing in Naruto. He trailed off. What about Naruto? Both Anko and Karinai asked, their curiosity evident. He's near impossible to read, he explained shortly. Karinai gave him an irritated glance. But Anko simply nodded down to a T, as usual Cyclops, she muttered. Why thank you, Anko-san, Kakashi chuckled. Suddenly, Kakashi froze in place. For the moment, Anko and Kurinai simply stared at him. But as they turned, a familiar figure entered the bar. Tall, lean and dressed in green spandex. The imposing figure of Mado Guy. Kanoa's green beast caused fear among his comrades for reasons not entirely connected to his taijutsu skills. In an instant... The three Jounin vanished from the bar, leaving only a small amount of money to pay for their bill. Guy stood silently, his brows furled in concentration. I was certain I had seen my youthful rival here. He muttered as he started running the second part of his 1,000 laps around the village. A week later, 
6 o'clock Hokage's office. Hiruzen Surtobi sighed idly as he watched his adoptive grandson read on his couch. During the past month, he had improved by leaps and bounds. Next to him was the young Achiha. SSK had cheered up a bit recently, but his disposition certainly wasn't helped by the always fawning Sakura. Strangely enough, the girl had also shown some improvement recently. The only one missing was their sensei, Kakashi Hitaki. Thankfully, he still had five more minutes to show up. Naruto, Sakura, and SSK all stared in shock at the timely appearance of their sensei. No way SSK muttered. On time? Sakura wondered. Naruto turned his gaze towards the old Hokage and smirked, noticing the smirk on the old man's face. You told him to come an hour earlier, he gleefully said, causing Kakashi to sweat drop and the old Hokage to start laughing. As soon as the situation calmed down, all four of them gathered in front of the desk. Team 7, I have a C-rank mission for you. The old Hokage began explaining a number of bandits have recently attacked several seaside villages along the southern edge of the country. Intelligence places no ninja at the site, so there shouldn't be much problem. But be advised that there were kidnappings. Saratobi paused for a moment. Letting the information sink in your orders are to travel to Kazashi Village directly south from here. Help the defenses intercept the next attack and after it. Follow the retreating forces to their main camp and eliminate them. There was an air of finality to the old man's words as a deafening silence spread across the room. For the first time, they were expected to kill. None of them liked the idea, but it was the harsh reality of their life. They accepted the mission, and under orders to pack for a month-long mission, they were to gather at the south gate, 7 o'clock sharp. Sakura was shocked to see that her sensei was not only on time, but actually early. Next to him, however, was someone that caught her attention. At first she wondered if it was the same person she knew, but even she had seen him change recently. If nothing, his choice of clothes had improved. A rather good-looking red and black coat, over a simple light brown shirt and dark brown trousers, a kanai holder attached to his right leg, while a scroll holder was attached to his right, along with a quality leather bag attached to his belt on his right side. But that wasn't what shocked Sakura. No, what shocked her was the look on the boy's face. Grim, determined, and completely focused. His normally pale skin had tanned over the past months, and the malnourished look was now gone. He's still not as good-looking as SSK Kuen, she reminded herself. Hey, Naruto, Kakashi-sensei, she said, waving at the two. Kakashi lazily waved back and returned to reading his smut. Sakura Naruto quietly greeted in an emotionless tone and returned his attention to writing his own notes. Sakura was positively shocked. There was Naruto, the hyperactive blonde idiot, who had the biggest crush on her, greeting her without any emotion or interest. She was angry, annoyed, and sad, but she decided against saying anything. Something about that troublesome blonde boy worried her. A few minutes later, Naruto's concentration was broken by a loud squeal of cursing the gods of creation for giving the girl such strong lungs, he quickly pocketed his notebook. Dobe SASK sent his normal greeting. Team Naruto replied. Kakashi, on the other hand, was entertained by the exchange. Unlike their usual conversations, this lacked any malice, and he could have sworn that there was even some warmth to their usual insults. After Naruto bared his past before Inari and Wave, SSK had started changing for the better, accepting that he wasn't the only one with a shitty life so far. He watched curiously as Naruto started digging through his bag. He drew out a small scroll and threw it to SASK. Catch team. That's the stuff I promised, he quickly explained with a mischievous smile, which SSK to Sakura and Kakashi's shock returned. What? They both deadpanned at the shock Jenin and Jounin. Kakashi sheepishly scratched his head and gave the order to go. As the four-man cell made its way towards Kazashi village to the far south, an uncomfortable silence pervaded between them. Naruto had set his mind to autopilot as his senses expanded around him. He focused on his notes regarding the cursed seal on Anko. He was still royally pissed at the infernal construction as he couldn't figure out how to break the torture seal without breaking the chakra amplifier and killing Anko in the process. As much as he hated to admit it, Orochimaru was a genius. Freaking snake bastard, he muttered while his three companions gave him strange looks, wondering what the hell he was thinking about. The journey southward was uneventful, 
and the cold sea air was felt within hours as they passed the wooded lowlands that led to coast. Naruto watched and enjoyed the landscape that stretched before him. The sparse woods made sure that he didn't have to many landing options to his normal tree running, but he could still enjoy the vibrant colors of the land around him. The clear blue and white of the skies above him, the cold bluish tone of the mountain rocks in the distance, the green, red, and yellow of the forest around him, and finally the deep blue of the distant ocean. His features relaxed at the sights that were before him. He rarely had the time to enjoy such pleasures. He hardly noticed that the others were chatting and giving him somewhat concerned looks. Well, his behavior was strange. He had to admit that much. He felt better than he did in years now that he had taken his life seriously, and it showed. Now that his mask was off, his features seemed more like a veteran ninja than a fresh genin. His musings were interrupted by the magnificent sight of the open sea bast in the sun's late day golden light. Naruto made a genuine smile as he observed the light dance on the sea's surface, and his companions, following where his eyes went, soon joined him. It's so beautiful, Sakura whispered. Naruto simply shook his head. She only now realizes he idly thought. In the distance, he could see the village they were supposed to protect. Sensei, Naruto yelled, pointing at the village. Haikakashi quickly replied as the team ran along the coastline to prepare Hengis. We shouldn't attract attention until we reach our client. Kakashi quickly added, quickly noting that Naruto wasn't using hand seals to perform the hench. The four quickly transformed into nondescript travelers as they slowed down to continue their journey on foot. Kazashi Village was actually a rather interesting place. While not overly large, it had several key features, which was probably why the bandits attacked. First, the village was walled off, surrounding a small cove that was used as a natural harbor and storm shelter. Second, it was the residence of a number of fishermen and pearl divers, which ensured a stable income to the populace. And third, a number of trade routes with a nearby tea country went straight through there. The team showed their forged travel documents to the gate guards and easily passed without attracting any attention. SASK and Sakura were still wondering how was the blonde enigma that was traveling with them able to stay completely silent. Naruto was taking his time studying the town. The walls, while well-designed, still had their weaknesses. The city had three gates, each facing north, east, and west, while to the south was the open sea. The large number of merchants, a few taverns, an inn, and a few shops made sure that there was a lot of traffic in and out of town. A quick check showed him that his sensei was doing the same thing as him. After taking a look at the general architecture, Naruto moved his sights to the people around him. He was surprised to notice that there weren't as many civilians in the streets as there were guards patrolling. The tension and fear were obvious. Q, you awake? Naruto focused his thoughts to his tenant, probing to see if the ancient fox was sleeping. Mm. Yan, I'm awake, a quick response was heard. What do you make of the situation here? He quickly asked. While Naruto had some sense of pride, he certainly wasn't above asking someone with far more experience for their opinion. Besides, he already drew all the conclusions he could. Hum, nothing much over what you already figure out, Q commented. But have you noticed that some of the houses are empty? Empty? What the hell? Naruto internally argued. There were a few options going from there. One was that a part of the population had evacuated, and the other was that they were either dead or kidnapped. Sensei? He asked in worried tone. So you've noticed it too? The silver-haired Jounin replied. Naruto quickly nodded. Why do I get the feeling that we get all the sea turn A missions? Naruto mumbled in a voice laden with sarcasm. Kakashi and SSK chuckled, while Sakura was simply annoyed. Your bad luck, Dobe SSK smugly joked, at which Naruto only broke a grin. The other members of the Ream watched with interest the new relations between the two team members, before Kakashi interrupted the playful banter. We split up here. Sakura... Go to the inn and get us two rooms, one by the other. Hi, Sensei Sakura quickly replied. Naruto, hinge and check the docks and gates for any suspicious characters. It's just recon, don't attack anyone. I get the feeling we won't be sleeping much tonight. NSASK, you go and talk to the commander of the guard. Find out whatever you can from the man. Hi, both boys quickly replied. We meet at the inn in three hours. Now go. And with that, the group scattered. One o'clock a room at the local inn. Kakashi, for once wasn't busy reading his favorite pastime book, 
better known as Ica, Ica Paradise. Right now, he was evaluating the skills his team had shown during the mission so far. He was pleasantly surprised at the lack of usual conflict between the three and the level of efficiency at which they handled their assigned tasks. He was reasonably pissed off, but it could be worse. The mayor knew very little about the attackers except that they usually attacked and kidnapped people during the night. Thankfully, the commander of the guard was more forthcoming as he provided useful information on the general numbers and state of equipment of the bandits. But what seriously worried him was the report given by Sakura and Naruto. Sakura had overheard conversations from the room next door about the attacks. And from what she heard, there could be people inside working with the bandits, and that that was why they could work so easily. Naruto located several shady characters in the docks and near the East Gate, so he left Hen's shadow clones to guard the areas, along with two more, one at each gate. But the key detail was the fact that he had seen some of them enter the basements of several buildings. He wrote a quick report and sent it to the Hokage via one of his neen dogs. He smiled, watching his team asleep. Should something happen, Naruto snapped awake, violently jerking himself from his bed and startling Kakashi in the process. There here was all he said as both of them rushed outside, quickly joined by Sakura and SASK. Where are they? Kakashi quickly asked as all of them rushed along the rooftops. North gate, there's about 70 of them, all thugs and bandits, but they managed to break through the gate. Naruto quickly explained. Shit, SASK muttered. Did you put the gloves on? Naruto quickly asked, now's not the time to mess around. Yeah, they're on, SASK quickly replied. Cut the chatter, Kakashi tossed each and every one of them a small ear-mounted communicator. They are all set to a single frequency, report in every two minutes. Sakura, cut them off to the east, SASK. Heading from the west, Naruto and I are going directly from the south. Move out with Sakura. Sakura was positively nervous at the turn of events but the sheer adrenaline rush of the situation kept her going. She hurried over the low roofs until she spotted several figures sneaking through the shadows in an alley beneath her. She quickly called on all of her training, thinking up how to get rid of the two without dying herself. Two bandits were sneaking along the alley, trying to avoid detection for as long as they could. The guards were mostly dead or disabled, so now was the time to plunder this town. They were momentarily surprised as they saw a pink-haired girl standing in the street, pointing at them. Unfortunately, they were startled long enough for a third shadow to sneak up on them and stab two kanai, one at the base of each of their skulls, instantly killing them. Sakura silently cursed and felt the bile rising up her throat at the thought that she just killed someone. But lessons from the academy came back quickly. She remembered perfectly what happened to Kunoichi, who were captured in the line of duty. She would not allow it to happen. This is Sakura, two down and moving on over, with SASK. Unlike his pink-haired teammate, SASK was ready for this. Having your entire family killed and then watching it all again for hours on end did wonders for his sensitivity to death. He didn't have any. He wickedly rubbed the new pair of gloves Naruto fixed up for him, a wide grin on his face. Once he put his old opinions aside, he found Naruto to be a good guy and a good friend, the likes of which he was unsure if he deserved. Uchiha arrogance be damned. He noticed a small group of five men, one of them carrying a tied-up woman on his shoulder. Slavers. He spat as he felt his blood boil. There were a lot of things he didn't like, but slavery was one thing he decidedly despised. Time to test these nasty new gloves. He drew closer, his new, full black suit allowing him to meld into the shadows far easier than his old clothes. Channeling a small bit of chakra into his glove, a single shuriken popped out, near silently crackling as it gave away a soft bluish glow. Let's see how they like these. He quickly popped a kanai from his right glove, similarly charged, and threw both. SASK prided himself on his accuracy and always liked a challenge, but these men didn't even seem to expect an attack. He quickly moved to another position, noting while moving that two of the men were dead. Remember to conserve your chakra. Unless you're fighting tougher opponents, keep to weapons rather than jutsu. He perfectly remembered what Kakashi Sensei repeated several times. The remaining three men were now panicked. All of them drew their weapons, two of them had swords, and one had a large axe, but it seemed that except for one of them, they weren't too good at using them. With a sickeningly sweet smile, he popped another two kanai this time avoiding to charge them, 
and after waiting for a few seconds to get a blind spot, he threw them. Thump! Thump! Two corpses hit the ground. The last thug, carrying the tied-up woman now fully panicked, and dropped her, trying to run for his life. SASK quickly jumped down, checking on the woman before he sent a final canai that hit the retreating bandit. This is SASK, five down, moving on over with Naruto and Kakashi. Forsaking all stealth to draw out as many bandits as possible, Naruto and Kakashi found themselves surrounded by at least 30 bandits. Back to back, standing atop corpses, with a kanai in hand each, they were planning their next move. Kakashi Sensei, I have a plan, but I'll need you to trust me and stand perfectly still. Naruto said, panting while stabbing in Ninja Ten. What are you going to do? Kakashi asked, parrying a blow and sliding the edge of the kanai into another bandit's throat 15. Go blind on them, he quickly said, and Kakashi picked up what he meant, both stabbing another bandit dumb enough to get within reach 11 feet 16 inches. Do it, I'll get you some cover. Naruto quickly threw his kanai into the face of one of his opponents, instantly killing him, all the while quickly flashing through a few quick hand seals. 12. Ninja Art Hidden Miss Jutsu, he whispered, just loud enough for Kakashi to hear it. The bandits panicked as suddenly a thick mist surrounded them, cutting off all vision. Kakashi made a grim face as he drew a second kanai and closed his eyes. The scream should start right about. A heart. 13 for him. Thank Kami that the adrenaline keeps him too high to think about the killing. Let's just hope he also forgets the bet. Seemingly at random, almost every second, Blood-curdling screams and falls of corpses were heard throughout the mist, the work of an unseen killer as he moved invisibly in a macabre dance of blood and metal. After a full minute, the fog started to dissipate, revealing a fearsome sight. Like a horrifying god of war from tales of old, Naruto Uzumaki stood, leaning on the Kobikiri Hocho, an eerie bluish-white light glowing around it, atop a pile of corpses. His red coat was flying in the wind, undamaged by the action while he was panting. Kakashi watched in shock that the former dead last of the academy had done this, without as much as a scratch on him. Bastards. Naruto here. All down. Area clear. Over. Naruto quickly shed the chakra shell, leaving a perfectly clean sword, and sat down to rest, raising his hitaite from his eyes. He loudly sighed at his approaching sensei. There's five of them alive, but paralyzed, I made sure to leave a few for interrogation. He quietly explained. He was feeling ill from the slaughter that he knew he had committed. Sixty people dead by his hand. Kakashi sensei? He stuttered, I just be butchered as sixty people. I'm a monster, he nearly cried. The adrenaline in his body was gone. It was one thing to fight back against an enemy, but this was slaughter. He shivered as Kakashi sat down next to him, putting a hand over his shoulder. This is a dilemma that all shinobi face he started in the kindest, most comforting tone he could gather. We ask ourselves whether the killing we do was right. Should we have taken a life? Know this, there is very little black or white in our world. You are not a monster. You killed bandits who were preying on the local populace. You didn't just kill, you protected. You didn't kill indiscriminately for pleasure. You drew no pleasure from the fact that you killed. Does it ever get any easier? Naruto asked in a somewhat calmer, but still rather shaky voice. Yes and no. You learn to steal yourself. You were worried about what you felt when you killed these men. Don't, you're human. For the day you stop feeling anything for the people you kill, you will stop being human and become a true monster. Naruto visibly calmed at his words, considering this piece of wisdom and accepting is as the truth. Kakashi smiled at his student. He was growing well. Apart from the first man, all others were clean kills with minimal pain. They quickly located the few living bandits that were paralyzed by Naruto's liberal application of lightning jutsu. So, you figured out one of the jutsu I gave you in a week? Kakashi asked, his voice a mixture of pride and curiosity. Naruto smirked. I learned all five and mastered all of them except for the fire one. Mastered? Kakashi asked, now surprised. I can even do the shocking paralysis without any hand seals or words. So that's how you knock them out. Sighing tiredly, they both ate a food pill while waiting for SASK and Sakura to join them. The sun's morning rays unveiled a somber scene seen outside the northern gate of Kazashi village. 
The corpses of over a hundred bandits that attacked last night were piled up and burned, the populace thanking Kami for the wind coming from the sea, carrying the stench away. Sakura and SASK were pale and worried. But Naruto was even worse. He still wasn't completely over the fact that he killed so many people last night. Although the fact that he won the bet against Kakashi helped raise his morale a bit. Kakashi, on the other hand, felt tired. He decided to sacrifice his time of sleep to let his team recover. While he interrogated the few prisoners they gathered about the location and numbers of the bandit base. Hearing that there were over 300 bandits left, Kakashi immediately sent for backup. And thankfully, they would be arriving within a couple of hours. It would be Karinai's team as they are the best trackers of all the rookie teams in Kanoha. Kakashi tiredly watched his team as they sat down in a local tavern to get some breakfast. They were all exhausted. Even the normally energetic Naruto was tired. Besides, the fact that all of them made their first kill, no kills last night, didn't really help their mood, but they took it better than expected. He smiled. His team had come far from what they were at the academy. He nearly laughed when he thought of the Chunin exams. If someone asked him two months ago if he would let them compete, he would have said no outright. Now, he'd settle for a malicious laugh as he signed them in, and he would most likely do just that. This little train of thought had raised his spirits considerably, while his team mumbled something about crazy teachers at his mildly disturbing smile. The mood had finally improved, and while tired, they soon started talking. All of them. Sakura had stopped fawning over SSK and spoke with Naruto normally. SSK and Naruto were still insulting each other as usual, but where once was malice, now there was mirth. He had gladly joined in the conversation, and they were all talking like old friends. For the first time in years, Hataki Kakashi remembered what it felt like to have a family, and this was damn close. They went back to the inn to get some rest before their reinforcements arrived. Soon enough, SASK and Sakura were dozing off, and Kakashi had fallen asleep while Naruto stayed awake to keep watch, and, as usual, go through his notes on seals and fix up his coat. He silently thanked the old man for the reparation seal, otherwise he'd be left with a destroyed coat. As hours passed, Naruto was increasingly bored. His unnatural stamina had its advantages, and with just a few hours of relaxation, he was almost back to normal. Thankfully, before his musings on pranks went too far, he felt four stronger chakra signatures approaching his door. His sharpened senses easily identified the smell of one Kiba Inazuka and his dog Akamaru, along with the bug-like countenance of Shino Aburame. Teammate Kakashi-sensei, wake up he quickly prodded the silver-haired Jown and the cavalry is here. Kakashi jerked up from his light sleep, turning to sit normally and watching his crazy student with a smile, getting a good idea what he planned to do from his mischievous smile. On the other side of the door, a certain raven-haired Jounin, followed by her team, was about to knock on the door when she heard a voice. Enter. The door is unlocked. Inside, Kakashi laughed as he was pretty certain that Kurinai on the other side was just about to knock and laughed even more when he saw her surprised face, quickly waking up as Siske and Sakura. Hello, Kurinai-san, Kiba, Hinata. Shino Naruto jokingly saluted, trying hard to control his laughter as he didn't lift his head from the notebook he was reading. Kakashi replied with a light wave as he stopped his laughter. Hello to you too, Naruto. Anko sends her regards, Karinai teasingly replied, hoping to see at least a blush on the boy's face, but was quickly disappointed. Kakashi, on the other hand, remembered the talk that he, Karinai, and Anko had on the subject of everyone's favorite blonde gaki. He smiled. Likes like Anko has it in for Naruto. That's nice to hear, Karinai-san. I'll be sure to express my gratitude when I come home, he replied nonchalantly, causing Karinai to slightly blush at the double meaning of the statement, while the others present stared at Naruto's witty remark. What? He deadpanned. Nightfall. Forest to the northeast of town. Radio communications. Strike force. This is Sentry 1. In position. Over Sakura's voice echoed over the radio connection. Sentry 2. In position. Over Shino's monotone voice quickly joined. As Sentry 3, in P position, over Hinata's stuttering voice followed. Extraction team, awaiting orders, over Karinai sent in an calm voice. Strike Force Commander here, start the operation Kakashi's voice ordered. Within the reaches of this bandit cam, the day came to an end as it usually did, with food, alcohol, gambling, and sex. A single man sadly sighed at the situation around him, 
disgusted by the actions of his two fellow Nukneen. As a former grass shinobi, Kirihizachi has a degree of pride and honor, and there are things that he would not do. Rape was one of them. He didn't mind the occasional drink, but the drunkards around him sickened him. Standing up from the log he was sitting on, he cursed as a chewed on bone hit him. He decided to leave this place. A single man could only do so much, and he was sure that his companions would rather stay here. He would not miss them. Perhaps a life on the run would be better anyway. His musings were, however, rudely interrupted as he felt a number of chakra signatures around him. Ninja, most likely leave here to exterminate the entire camp. Well, it wasn't that much of a surprise, he thought idly as the bandits around him were completely oblivious to their impending doom. The group that attacked last night was wiped out, and the idiots still do nothing. My time is nearly up as it is. Perhaps among them there will be one. He smirked as he heard the first explosion, and felt one of the ninja that infiltrated the camp move into the fearless leader's tent. With SASK and Karinai, SSK silently cursed as he and Karinai sneaked through the camp, their chakra suppressed so as not to attract any attention. Their target was the a large grayish tent where, according to Shino, the leader of the bandits was sleeping. The task was simple, try and enter without attracting any attention, or use the distraction caused by the attack to move and disable him. Karinai silently cursed as she noticed the patrolling guards, and one of them was a former grass ninja. S.A.S.K., while somewhat cocky, wasn't idiotic enough to get himself needlessly killed. So he prepared a kanai and awaited further orders. Extraction team, awaiting orders over Karinai sent in a calm voice. With Shino, the calm and morose bug user carefully watched one of the four exits from the valley, his bugs and traps ready to take down anyone who tried to escape that way. He was still wondering to the nature of the change he had seen in the members of Team 7. The former class clown, Uzumaki Naruto now had the appearance of a veteran ninja, and if he correctly heard the report that Kakashi had sent, he was probably the strongest of the three genin in the squad. The change in others was nothing less remarkable. SASK wasn't brooding and not once did he raise an objection to working as a team with others, even though he and Naruto kept insulting each other at every opportunity. There was no more malice between the two. Sakura had stopped clinging to SASK and had spent the little free time they had chatting with Inada. Also, she seemed far more confident than before. Sighing as he finished his preparation, he quickly clicked the communication headpiece. Sentry 2, in position, over Shino's monotone voice, quickly joined. With Sakura, unlike the other sentries, Sakura asked Naruto to borrow a few explosive tags, and along with some of her ninja wire had set up a fine collection of traps through her exit. A pair of kanai resting in her hands, and a number of shuriken prepared for throwing meant that all she now had to do was wait. Strike force. This is Sentry 1, in position, over Sakura's voice echoed over the radio connection. With Hinata, while lacking confidence, today, Hinata Hyuga was on a crusade to prove herself to her longtime crush, Naruto Uzumaki. Unfortunately for her, the blonde was still a bit dense when it came to social interaction and was all but blind to her affections. Sighing sadly, she took her position near one of the exits, using Hei Byakugan to keep watch. No one would be passing by her. As Sentry 3, in P position, over Hinata's stuttering voice followed. With Naruto, Kiba, and Kakashi, the three ninja awaited in their concealed position near the last remaining entrance to the small valley, and therefore camp, for the signals of the others. Strike Force Commander here, start the operation Kakashi's voice ordered, and as one, the three ninja charged forth into the base, drawing as much attention as humanly possible. Naruto laughed at Kiba's shocked look as he unsealed the massive sword and charged forward. He had seen what these men had done, and there was little mercy left in him as the nearest bandit found out while his head was separated from the rest of his body. His compatriots weren't any luckier than him as one was turned into mincemeat, courtesy of Kiba's and Akamaru's combo piercing fong attack while the other two were burned to cinders by Kakashi's fire jutsu. This explosive opening immediately attracted the attention of the entire camp, although those nearby weren't so fortunate, as Naruto and Kakashi threw a veritable hailstorm of kanai, every second one with an exploding tag rolled up around the hilt. For the first time in his life, Kibo was speechless. The veteran Jounin and the crazed blonde were working perfectly as a tandem, 
quickly wiping out wasp parts of the camp while still avoiding any of the enslaved women and children. He was positively awed by the sight in front of him, but quickly snapped out and rejoined him. Kurinai had warned them not to underestimate Naruto Uzumaki, and now he got a first-hand demonstration why the shocking fact that he had willingly blinded himself with his Hittite added to his awe. The time of the attack, combined with their target's inebriated state, allowed the two to decimate their opponents. But the next event positively floored him as the two ninjas simultaneously yelled. Shadow clone jutsu. A cloud of dust and smoke quickly rose across the battlefield, but quickly dissipated to reveal two dozen Naruto and Kakashi clones, each and every one of them armed to the tooth. He and Akamaru followed and tried to keep up, but it was obvious just how outmatched they were. Similar thoughts occurred to the bandits, who were now in full rout. The remaining 200 bandits and thugs were being systematically decimated without mercy. And as he heard over the radio, those who tried to escape were quickly eliminated by the sentries placed at the exits. Naruto finally got a chance to vent the rage he'd been feeling ever since he found out that the damnable bandits practiced slavery, one of the few things that Naruto had no intention of forgiving. But it felt strange and wrong to be able to take lives so easily. He had no illusions that these men were innocent or that killing them would be a loss of life. Quite the contrary. Since the battle less than a day ago, he had come to terms with the taking of life and accepted it as the reality of his chosen profession. Take one life to preserve others, but never kill indiscriminately. Never betray comrades. Grow strong to protect, not to destroy. Protect what is precious. The lives of the people endangered were precious. The lives of his teammates were precious. He would protect them with a grim look of determination. He waded back into combat. Kakashi spared a moment to take a look at the impassive face of his student. He was happy that there wasn't any bloodlust or pleasure. He was unsure which would have been more disturbing. For a moment, he could have sworn that he had seen someone else fighting. Strike force, we have the leader proceeding to extraction point as agreed. Kiba, Naruto yelled, watch out friendlies. Kiba, who had by that time gotten closer to the duo, quickly nodded and continued and no more than a minute later, two shadows flashed by them, signaling that they were free to continue clearing the area. Kiri Hizachi watched the proceedings with great interest. He felt no sadness for his two, now former companions who died rather stupidly, as he had waiting for the battle to be over. The blonde boy and his sensei were the strongest of all present. He recognized the man as Hataki Kakashi, better known as Sharingan Kakashi, or the copycat ninja, but the boy was a mystery. The sword he wielded was easy to recognize. No one but the seven swordsmen would come up with such crazy weapons. What was even more interesting was that the boy wore his hatite over his eyes he smirked. Perhaps today would truly be the day, he sadly thought as he walked out of his hiding place and flared his chakra. Naruto and Kiba were panting as they recovered from the battle. After the whole ordeal, the rest of the two teams joined the aptly named Strike Force, their part of the mission accomplished. The captured leader would be interrogated and most likely executed afterward, but that was not their job. Now, at least they could go home, but that was not to be apparently as a strong chakra signature flared nearby. Both teams tensed as a man walked out of one of the overlooked tents, bearing a simple katana in his arms. Naruto studied the man. He was in his late 40s, but strongly built, tall, and not overly muscular. He noted the slash grass Hattaye tied around his neck. He was dressed in a simple green and white kimono and sandals. He had long black hair tied in a braid, along with a finely chiseled face and deep brown eyes, but what struck him most was the expression of his face and the emotions that his eyes gave away. Naruto couldn't place the name on a single emotion, but he knew the look too well. The look of a man tired of his life, simply waiting for it to end, and a small, faint sign of hope. Young one he spoke with a guarded voice, his thin finger pointing at Naruto, I would ask a favor of you. For a moment, a tense silence descended on the now empty bandit camp as Naruto stood up, his left hand on the handle of the Kubikiri Hocho. He was tired, but the man's face brought up his curiosity. What is it you wish, old man? He asked in a polite tone as the rest of the Kanoha ninja gathered behind him. To give me an honorable death, he said, his guard lowered and his voice void of any deception. Naruto stood silent for a moment, 
gazing into the man's tired eyes. For a single moment, he felt the weight life had placed on the said man's shoulders. Betrayal, loss of loved ones, death of friends, the burden of taking far too many lives for a man to remain completely sane. He was a man who simply wanted an end to it all. Was the loss so horrible? Naruto asked in a sad voice. Kiri laughed. It was a terrible thing, that laugh of his, hollow, broken, and void of any emotion. Enough so that I have no more hope, he explained sadly. I have found what I pray is a worthy opponent to end my life. Naruto. Kakashi started, but was quickly stopped when Naruto raised his hand. How do you wish to do this? He asked quietly. A full match. No rules until one of U.S. falls. Kiri explained. Naruto quickly nodded. Before we start, what is your name? Naruto quickly asked. Kiri Hizachi. And yours? Naruto Uzumaki. A pleasure meeting you. Likewise. Naruto quickly removed his red coat and handed it to Kiba who was standing nearby as he went over the seals on his arms. This would not be an easy battle. Kiri, on the other hand, simply watched the boy prepare himself for the battle. He knowingly smiled at the fact that the boy was giving him his best. He vaguely recognized the weight seals on both the boy's arms and legs, and he popped two pills into his mouth. Now he was ready. I would ask you all to stand back and not interfere, Naruto quietly asked in a solemn voice. His teammates were eyeing him nervously, but his sensei had accepted his decision and would respect it. Both ninja assumed their stances, blades drawn and charged. Kakashi sensei, what's going on? Why is Naruto fighting that man? Sakura asked questions in rapid succession. And before Kakashi could reply, Kiba added his two cents. And why are we helping him? Kakashi sighed sadly and wondered how to explain the situation to them. He wondered even more at the fact that Naruto was mature enough to understand what the man asked of him. So, how do I explain this? Sigh. That man has lost too much to keep living, he started uncertainly and only wishes that his death be in combat. A dying man's wish, as it were. I would ask, not to interrupt them, he smiled sadly. He knew the face the man wore all too well. He had seen that look on many of his comrades after the war, those who had lost everything they held dear. Naruto panted as they crossed blades. The older man was stronger than he was and far, far more experienced. He blocked every single attack he made with that katana of his. There's always that he smirked. A trick up your sleeve, young one? Kiri jokingly asked, but the look in his eyes said otherwise. A little something I figured out, Naruto replied, as he began pushing a vast amount of chakra into the sword. Kiri cringed at the build-up and tried to pull back. A single, how was heard before Naruto slammed his sword into that of his opponent, and the entire store of chakra inside was unleashed. Violently, for a second Kiri Hazachi watched in horror as his blade was broken into minuscule shards before he smiled. The boy was even better than he expected. The same could not be said for his right arm, which now bleed. On the other side, members of Team 7 and 8 watched in shock as a blue explosion pulverized Kiri's sword. Kakashi grinned at his pupil's trick. Kurinai watched in shock and remembered what Anko had said about the boy don't underestimate him. A few years and he'll be giving us all a run for our money. Unknown to the others, a third party was gleefully watching the battle. In his cage, stuck inside a forsaken sewer, oh, he was going to talk with his jailer about that, all right. The mightiest of all of the bijou, the nine-tailed demon fox, sat curled up and watched the show. Ah, if I only had some popcorn, he sighed wishfully as he enjoyed the sight of the boy using a technique that he had by himself figured out. Over the past few years, and more specifically the last two or three months, he began respecting the boy for his tenacity, raw guts, and wit. It was a shame that it took the death of someone the boy had found close to get him on the right track, but there was no use crying over spilled milk. He gave his word to help the boy. It was the least he could do for making his existence bearable. He wondered how much more could he teach the boy. Naruto smirked at his opponent and did his best to conceal that this attack drained nearly a fourth of his chakra. A slight miscalculation on his part, but it was worth it, as it gave him what he hoped would be an advantage. The old man was good. He charged at him for a horizontal slash, but Kiri quickly dodged beneath it, charging forward and slamming him in the gut and blowing his sword away with his other hand. Naruto cursed and jumped back, trying to avoid his enemy's attacks while he planned his next move. He had no more than a second before his enemy charged at him. Smiling, 
He quickly threw a kanai at his opponent, barely missing him. Kiri rushed Naruto, but silently cursed when the boy used the substitution jutsu to quickly replace himself with the hissing kanai he had just thrown. Wait, hissing? Shit. Naruto watched as his opponent went straight into the explosion and quickly started forming hand seals. Fire release. Phoenix fire. A number of small fireballs quickly fly towards the smoke cloud formed from the exploding tag, as Naruto once more begins a quick chain of hand seals, keeping silent as he sinks into the ground. Kiri once more cursed. He had planned this to be a worthy death, and the boy was quite worthy, but to be outsmarted like this by a genin? He was getting rusty. A sealless shunshin had gotten him away from the attack, but now his blonde opponent was nowhere in sight. Naruto, who had resurfaced behind a tree, rubbed his lower ribs. At least one of them was broken and bruised. The old guy packed quite a punch, and he still wasn't using any jutsu. And he was getting tired, as the fatigue of the battle caught up with him. He would have to finish this quickly. There was always that option. Sighing, he drew three small scrolls from their holder on his left leg immediately unrolling one and smearing his blood on its surface. He just prayed that this would work. He slowly walked out for his cover, causing a raised eyebrow from his opponent. Hey, old man, he said in a nervous voice, I want to try something. Smirking, his opponent started going through hand seals at an alarming rate. Naruto silently prayed that his knowledge hadn't failed him. Time slowed down for Naruto as he watched his opponent perform his seals rapidly cutting both his thumbs on his elongated canines. He threw both scrolls into the air, each of them unrolling as he smeared his blood on both. The action was followed by a quick succession of hand seals as both scrolls once more began to roll up. Slamming his hand with the third scroll, now attached to a kanai, into the ground he yelled, Secret art, triune hunters. For a moment, nothing happened. But Kiri's face soon changed from amused to horrified as the earth beneath his feet now held him in place. And then the two scrolls unleashed their attack, a blade of wind along with a lance of lightning, both of which pierced his chest in an instant. Both enemies smiled for a moment as they both fell on the ground, one dead, the other unconscious. The last sight both saw was a number of shinobi rushing towards Naruto. Two days later, Naruto quietly sighed as he stood over the grave of Kiri Hazachi, former grass chunin, and his first real opponent. He sadly smiled at the remains of the sword which were placed over his grave, along with his scratched attade. A modest burial, but sufficient. Paying his last respects to his former opponent, he rejoined his team as they went back home. Kanoha a week later, there are a few places within the village hidden in the leaves that are avoided by the populace. One such place is the AMBU headquarters, and another was Training Ground 44, better known as the Forest of Death. One would also wonder why a certain blonde boy was merrily jumping from one tree to the other, completely unfazed by the fact that in his immediate vicinity, were over 10 species of animals that would gladly make him their lunch. Then again, most of those animals knew trouble when they saw it, and a boy leaking killing intent was certainly trouble. So as long as he didn't bother them, they wouldn't bother him. Naruto Uzumaki had taken his day off to see a friend. She did tell him that he could find her here. Should have asked for a map, he quietly grumbled at the fact that he couldn't find the object of his quest into the forest. Although he found the place more than enjoyable. I should start training here, he idly thought as he jumped, searching for any trace of Anko's chakra. Thankfully, the old man had finished the debriefing quickly, even though he had to explain a few things. Flashback. Good work, Sarutobi heartily congratulated them before handing out the pay for the mission. Naruto, could you stay for a moment? Sure, old man, the blonde boy merrily answered. Naruto, show some respect for the Hokage Sakura screeched while bumping him on the head. Naruto merely sighed as the rest of his team, minus Kakashi, left the office. So, I heard you made a new jutsu, Saratobi curiously asked. Naruto assumed his thinking pose, his hand beneath his chin. I made a jutsu all right, but it still needs some tweaking. Yeah, I did, but it still needs some work, Naruto replied, sheepishly scratching the back of his head. The old Hokage laughed. Kakashi already explained but I'm curious as to how it works. Naruto once more found himself with two options. Neither would mind if he kept quiet, but were genuinely curious, and the knowledge might help both. Smiling, he began his lecture. First of all, I prepared three seal scrolls, 
each containing an array which gathers and converts chakra into one of the three used elements, earth, wind, and lightning. Now, the arrays are relatively complex, consisting of multiple chakra storage seals directly connected to a chakra burst seal coupled with a transformation seal, which gives the attacks their shape. A blood seal binds the three scrolls to the user, and after projecting two chakra strings, you throw both in the air while performing a sequence of hand seals that further shapes and focuses the attack at a specific target. After that, you slam the earth scroll into the ground, preferably via kanai. At that moment, the three scrolls activate and burn themselves out. The earth scroll makes a temporary prison for the victim, binding him up to his or her waist. The wind and lighting scrolls unleash two attacks aimed wherever you want them. The whole trick is that the scrolls unleash as much power as you send through the strings before activating them. Naruto completed his explanation, leaving a stunned Kakashi and a smiling Saratobi. Well, that was an excellent explanation. I'm glad to see that your sealing skills are improving at such a fast rate. Thanks, old man. I'll make sure to prepare a copy of my notes for these three for the next time I drop by. You do that Naruto, the Hokage idly added while drawing from his pipe. Kakashi one more made one of his eye smiles before vanishing in a poof of smoke. In flashback, at the same time, Anko Midarashi was returning from the ANBU interrogation center and heading for her small camp in her beloved forest of death. Bound to the place by memories both good and bad, most involving her old sensei, she also loved the place for its ferocity. It served as a home, a training ground, and finally as a refuge from the hateful glares and whispers. It was her personal sanctuary, and Kami helped whoever tried to defile it. She sensed a somewhat familiar chakra signature inside her small camp, and heaven helped the person there if he or she didn't have a good reason. However, her rage quickly vanished after she recognized the sleeping form of the young man who saved her life a while ago. Well, no one said she couldn't tease him a bit. Making a grin that would make most grown men run in fear, she slowly stalked her way over with a kanai in hand. When she was just a few steps away, she threw the kanai, aiming for his right cheek, curious as a cat to see how the blonde would react. She wasn't disappointed when the boy caught the kanai with his hand. You know, Anko-san, it really isn't polite to cut up people when they try to sleep, he said in a mock-scolding tone. It took a second for both to start laughing. So. What brings you here, Foxy? She asked with a big grin. Naruto merely returned one of his real smiles before unsealing a large platter of her favorite food. Can a friend just drop by for a visit? He asked jokingly. But the result of his joke surprised him as Anko made a serious face. The short flash of recognition he felt in the forest now returned. You consider me your friend? She asked. Her voice was worried, uncertain and just a bit hopeful. He sighed sadly. No one deserved such treatment. Yes, I do, he shortly explained before handing her the plate. She immediately perked up after his response. Say, how did you know I love Dango? I don't remember telling you that. I asked Karinai, he deadpanned, and Anko once more laughed. The boy was as direct as ever. So she started, purposefully elongating the, oh, how did your mission go? It was now Naruto's turn to get somber as he retold the events of his trip south. The killing he performed, and finally his battle with Kiri Hizachi. Anko intently listened to the boy's story, enjoying his detailed descriptions of events and places. After he finished his storytelling, they both simply laid down in the grass, watching the clouds slowly pass. You know Anko started. Catching the blonde Jinchuriki's attention, I had similar thoughts when I made my first kill. He smiled. He wasn't sure why, but even during their short stay in the forest a while back, talking with her was relaxing, to say the least. They were very much alike, both outcasts of society, hated for things beyond their power to control, both crazy in their own way. Thanks he softly whispered as he fell asleep next to her. For the first time in years, Anko made a gentle smile before doing the same. Next day, training ground seven. Once again, Sakura was treated to the sight of Naruto working over his notes. Sheesh Naruto, she started, but without any real anger, do you ever leave those notes? Naruto made a small smile before answering no. Shaking her head and muttering something about blonde idiots, she sat down next to him, dozing off until the rest of the team showed up. Much to her displeasure, they came within a few minutes. After what passes as customary greetings among Team 7, Kakashi pulled out three papers. Well, everyone, 
I've recommended you for the Chunin exams this year. If you want to participate, take this to room 301 in the Academy next Monday, 9 o'clock sharp. I've got to run now, so you think this over carefully, and good luck. With those words, Kakashi once more vanished in a cloud of smoke while the rest of Team 7 wondered what he was doing. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you all are enjoyed this video. If you do, please leave a like, share, and subscribe. Also, don't forget to support author of this fanfic. So let's end this video here. Until then, see you in next video.